Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner, um, uh, 5.41 example 11. I'm going to go super fast. Um, I recorded this video once. It, it took well over 20 minutes, and there's no way you're going to watch 20 minutes of me struggling with calculus. So I'm going to go uh, the abbreviated version. So we have this rotating sphere of uh, death. Uh, no, no, sphere's charge. Anyway, so omega points this direction. We're going to align the P with the Z axis. Um, so the, the omega is going to be in the x, z plane, so x, z, and y. Um, then we're going to integrate this surface area chunks that are at vector r. And of course, r curly is the difference between them. And then we're going to use s as a distance of the point p above the z axis. OK, so setting up our problem, we have our uh, magnetic potential vector is equal to mu naught over 4 pi integral of the k vector over uh, r dA. That's the magnitude of r, not the vector r. You can't divide by vectors unless you're very special. So let's rewrite this in terms that we're well familiar with. Um, so k is going to be, let's write it over here. That's going to be the surface charge times the velocity, which is just the surface charge times omega cross r vector, OK? And r squared is equal to um, the radius of the circle squared plus the distance from the origin, the point is, uh, minus 2 rs cos theta, where theta is the angle uh, here. That's theta. And um, the dA is going to be equal r squared sine theta d theta d phi. All right. Now, let's look at r cro a w cross r. Let's write that out. So omega cross r. I called it w. You can shoot me now. Um, I must not be a real physicist. Um, so omega is lying in the xz plane. So it's going to have uh, omega, let's call this c. So omega sine c, omega cosine c. And then the r is going to be r sine theta cos phi r sine theta sine phi and then r cos theta. Okay, now you'll notice that the integral that we're doing is going to be you know d phi and cosine phi and sine phi. So when you take the integral sine phi of d phi, the integral cosine phi d phi and go from 0 to 2 pi, the answer is going to be 0. So effectively these two terms are 0 in the integral. Okay, which is a nice, this is the reason why we put the omega vector into the xz plane, so we can get this nice symmetry going. So the only surviving component of the cross product is this j hat component, okay? And that's going to be this minus that. So we get omega sine, sine c times r cosine theta, right? So this is going to be equal to um, omega r sine c cos theta in the j hat direction, okay? The other components don't matter, okay? Now, the integral that we write out looks like this. So a vector of p equals mu naught over 4 pi. The integral uh, from 0 to 2 pi of, phi, of d phi. And then the integral uh, from 0 to pi of, uh, oh, I got to put all this junk in the front. Uh, well, r cubed, um, sigma, omega, sine c, all this is constant. And there's a 2. Oh no, this is 2 pi, that cancels to a 2. And then we get um, sine theta, cos theta, d theta, all over the square root of r squared plus s squared minus 2 rs cos theta. Okay. Um, this integral is not hard to solve. Um, he suggests using u equals cos theta which, you know, while it is a sound recommendation, um, there's further substitutions you'd have to do if you wanted to solve the integral on your own. So I recommend using u is equal to, u squared is equal to r squared plus s squared uh, minus 2 rs cos theta. And this substitution will get you um, to the very end where you can actually solve the integral um, rather easily. If you'll notice, u squared is actually just r. It's the same, okay? So if you just substitute um, uh, curly r in there, you'll get the right answer um, rather quickly. So um, 
the end result is oh one one little trick is remember that when you have the square root of something squared that's just the absolute value of the something right and you're going to find this because you're going to get r squared plus s squared minus 2rs or r squared plus s squared plus 2rs which is just r, r plus s squared or r minus s squared so that's a little trick that you're going to run into as well um, the end result is equal to um, mu naught over 2 r squared sigma omega sine psi and when r is less than, when r is greater than s, when you're inside the sphere you get um, 2s over uh, 3r squared and when it's outside you get um, 2r over 3s squared. Okay, this is when r is greater than r and this is when r is less than r. Okay, now at this point he substitutes um, omega cross s back in so that he can change his coordinate system. And what's omega cross s? That's omega r sine psi um, whatever. Okay, so he ends up with this. So he has omega not over 3 as uh, r as a constant sigma as a constant multiplying factor and then he gets up here um, omega cross s when r is greater than s and then he gets down here he has three more r's and two s's on the bottom omega vector cross s vector when r is less than s okay now if we revert back to the natural coordinate system um, the resulting field um, for a is expressed as it is in the book. Um, it's rather simple. And then he goes through and points out that the B vector, which is the divergence of A, no, the curl of A, oh, wow, I was freaking out there because I'm pretty sure it wasn't, um, is actually inside, it's constant. So it's, it's really weird that um, just like inside of a uh, hollow sphere, you know, the the electric field is constant. It doesn't change based on how close you are to the edge. Here in this rotating sphere example, the the magnetic field doesn't change according to how close you are to the edge as well. So that's a very condensed, very short version of this example. I encourage you to go and try to solve this on your own and walk through the book and fill in all the missing gaps for yourself. Um, it's a very interesting problem, just like all the problems that involve spheres. Um, it's uh, the integrals. You should be getting used to these integrals by now. They should be rather easy to solve. Anyway, hope that helps. Take care and bye.